Hi everyone, Ian here from the Media Center. Welcome to part two. In this video, I'll be taking a deep dive into the internal menu of the Red Komodo and looking at the optimal settings you can use for your production. Be sure to check out part one, where I covered the live panel interface and the optimal workflow for exposure and monitoring on the Komodo. So next, let's jump into the rest of the internal menu and look at the optimal settings you can use for your production. The first area we're going to look at is the image LUT area. When I click into here, we're able to adjust our ISO, shutter and white balance parameters. Now we can also adjust these from the main live viewing panel along the bottom column. But if you want to adjust them directly in the menu, you can do so from the image LUT window. When you click into a dedicated window, you can make these adjustments from the touch panel or you can use the up and down arrows. To confirm a change, you can either hit the select button or you can press the OK button. So we can set the ISO, shutter and white balance, but we can also adjust our output color space. Now the output color space is essentially a transform LUT which will place a color adjustment over the red raw file. And this non-destructive overlay can be displayed across either the Komodo's LCD or over the SDI if you have it enabled in the monitoring window. The color space you choose should be determined by the primary monitor that you intend to display the final image from. So DCI P3 is designed for cinema projectors REC 709 is designed for standard HD TVs, and your REC 2020 would be going to HDR TVs. If you don't want any of these color displays outputted, then red wide gamut RGB will give you the full flat color gamut of the red R3D RAW file. It's worth noting that none of these will be baked into the image if you're shooting in the R3D format. They're just metadata, which can be altered in your chosen NLE editor and are simply providing a technical output LUT, which can help you to determine how the image will appear once corrected in post-production. I'm going to choose Rec 709, as these will be the primary output color spaces that my work would be displayed on. If your primary output were cinema projectors, then DCI-P3 would be a more suitable option. Below these, you can also adjust the output tone map and highlight roll off. Again, these will not bake into the R3D file. Instead, this will all be saved as metadata and can be changed during the post-production process as you'll always be recording with the raw information. In output tone map, you can set a range of contrast intensities ranging from low, medium, high, and none. As they suggest, they will increase or decrease the amount of contrast coming from the output color space. For the highlight roll off, we can choose very soft, soft, medium, hard, or non. The default by red is soft for highlight roll off and medium for the output tone map. You then also have a display preset, and this is for the type of external monitor you'll be displaying out to. Most of the time, you'll be using an SDR standard display while HDR and HLG are designed for high dynamic range monitors. And then finally, we have the 3D LUT window. Now these are additional LUTs which you can add on top of the technical LUT, which is selected via the output color space. And these will provide you with a creative look, which will be applied on top of the technical LUT. So you can enable it from this window and you can choose the type of LUT you'd wish to select. Acromic is a black and white LUT. Red Film Bias provides a subtle filmic look with a nice soft color palette. Bleach Bypass aims to replicate the bleaching process achieved on film stock. And Film Bias Offset creates the same soft color palette as regular Film Bias, but adds some additional warmth. These LUTs can be downloaded from Red's website or directly exported from the camera and utilized in your editing system, such as Premiere and DaVinci. This means you can monitor and reference what your image may potentially look like when corrected in post-production, as these LUTs will match what you're using in the editing interface. 
you can also add your own LUTs. On media LUTs are ones that we can add directly from the CFAS 2.0 card. When I click in here, you'll see it says import or import all. And if we had LUTs that were specifically designed for the red Komodo, we could import them directly from here. Once they've been imported, they would appear in the in-camera LUTs page. The in-camera LUTs are the same shown as in the LUT selection window, because these are currently in camera. So if I click into here, you'll see we have the same LUTs. Similarly, if you want to export any of these LUTs, so you have them on your own card, you can do so by going to export or export all options. For the time being, you don't need to worry about CDL or the exposure adjust. I would recommend leaving these at their default. Next is the project settings page. And this is where we can set our format and resolution. When I select this window, we have three options, Super 35 6K, an anamorphic Super 35 version, and then an all formats version. The 6K Super 35 will only let you choose 6K resolutions in different aspect ratios. So if you want to shoot in different resolutions, for example, 2K, 4K, or 5K, you'll need to select the All Formats option and alter the resolution from here. This is the area I'd recommend using if you're changing resolution and aspect ratio. We then have our recording frame rate. And in here, this is where we choose the frame rate we are directly capturing in camera. Because I'm shooting in 6K, the maximum frame rate available is 40 frames per second as opposed to a resolution like 2K, which would allow me to shoot up to 120 frames. So I'm gonna keep it at 25 for now. Our project time base refers to the project timeline that you'll be editing in. So if you want your footage to be in real time, you'll want your recording rate and project base to match. If you wanted to record slow motion, you would change your recording frame rate to a higher frame rate option, and now you can see we're recording at 40 frames per second and interpolating it to 25. Now, when recording in slow motion, the recording frame rate will appear in yellow to indicate that they're not matching. I don't want to record in slow motion at the moment, so I'm gonna change it back to 25 frames. We can see that both frame rates appear as gray when real-time recording is set up. After this, we have our file format. And this is where we can choose whether we record in the R3D format or if we record in the ProRes codec. Now, if we want to take advantage of the camera's incredible dynamic range and 16-bit image adjustability, then the R3D format should always be the user's first choice. This R3D format is used across all of RED's cameras and utilizes their fantastic IPP2 color pipeline and the Log 3G10 gamma space giving near unparalleled levels of image control. Because this pipeline is supported across all major editing systems, it doesn't really make much sense to use the inferior ProRes codec, especially when the data sizes are negligible. So although ProRes is available, the R3D files are the superior format, and this would be our recording recommendation. This also means you'll always be recording in the red raw color gamut, which means the output color space, tone map, highlight roll off, and 3D LUTs will never be baked into the image. If you were to record in ProRes, you could accidentally burn in these color spaces, which would severely limit the dynamic range and the adjustability of the image. We then have the R3D quality, and within here we have a variety of options. We have the HQ option, which is designed for VFX, the MQ option, which is designed for high-end film and independent film production, and the LQ quality, which is designed for corporate and content creation. I'd recommend sticking with the MQ quality, as this is what RED recommends for cinema production. And all of these options utilize the 16-bit RAW format, so you're always going to be capturing an extreme amount of detail. You'll notice that the ProRes options and codecs are grayed out and disabled when the file format is set to R3D. Just below these, we also have a pre-record option and slate option. 
When enabled, pre-record means a designated number of frames and seconds can be captured before the recording button is pressed. The number of frames available will be dependent on the resolution you've chosen. I rarely use this because in narrative film, you'll begin recording the video and audio before the clapperboard is used, meaning you'll always be recording before the scene begins. But it can be useful in wildlife, sports, and documentary workflows. We also have the slate area, and within here we can select the camera's ID and position letter. If you're using the Komodo, I would assume it would be the A cam, with cameras like the C70 or Blackmagic being a B or C cam. So that was the main project settings window. Below this, we have the audio window, and the information displayed here will mirror the audio information available from the live viewing page inside the audio quick reference menu. So from here, we can switch between internal and external audio sources and choose whether they're used together or independently of one another. You can also choose to have no microphones enabled. However, I wouldn't recommend this as you'll always need scratch audio for sync sound. Ideally, even if you're adding an external microphone, it would still be a good idea to have the internal microphone enabled as well, just in case the external mic fails. As we move down throughout this window, we can also adjust the gain levels, so the volume of each mic, and link the microphones across two channels. We can also adjust our headphone volume, and we can also choose whether our headphones are referencing the internal microphone or the external microphone. Unfortunately, you can't listen to both at the same time. It's one or the other. You'll still see the audio source sound levels on the audio scale, but you wouldn't be able to hear it. At present, we don't need to worry about the timecode source or jamming the timecode, as we currently don't use Genlock or have any wireless timecode sync solutions. However, this is something we're hoping to utilize at a later date. Next, we have our monitoring area, and within here, we can adjust our LCD and STI parameters. In the LCD, we can adjust the brightness. The LCD refers to the camera's top panel. We can choose whether we have our guides and tools enabled, and our magnification can also be turned on from here. I've already covered how these work on the live viewing page, so this is just another area where they can be enabled. The additional parameter available within this area is look. And when you choose this option, we can select either the RWG log 3G10 look, or we can choose image LUT. Now, if we're recording with the red raw R3D files, we'll always be capturing the log 3G10 color space. However, we can display on the screen whether we're looking at the native 3G10 image or a color corrected LUT overlay, which is set via the output color display and 3D LUT menus. Again, I just want to reiterate that as long as you're capturing in the R3D format, this will not burn into your image. It will just be an overlay on the live viewing page. So if you want to view the unaltered native image, choose log 3G10. And if you wanted to see your output color space and 3D LUTs, choose image LUT. I'm going to choose log 3G10. This same information can also be set via the SDI. However, we also have additional things such as resolution and frequency in this area. Resolution should ideally be the same as your monitor you're outputting to, and the frequency should ideally match the frame rate you're capturing. In my case, that's currently 25. Again, we can select our guides, tools, and magnification, and we can also select the look for the SDI as well. Again, we can choose the log 3G10 image to be displayed across an external monitor, or the output color space and 3D LUT. Now, if we've picked the LUT on the SDI and the log image on the LCD, we'll be able to see the native image on the LCD and view the technical and creative overlay through the SDI. Some people like to do this as it gives the user an idea of what the image may look like once color corrected in post-production, while also being able to monitor the true log image underneath. For now, I'll set my SDI to image LUT, so it will be displaying the technical and creative LUTs. 
Finally in this area we also have an overlay function. When enabled we'll have the option to have either an advanced overlay or a simple overlay and all this means is the amount of information being presented to the user across the external monitor. Now because we're using a small HD monitor which has been specifically designed for the Komodo and the monitor has a page for full Komodo control we'll actually already have all the information we need so we don't really need to use the advanced option. So because of this, I'll keep it as simple. Coming out of here, we don't need to worry about live streaming and the tools and guide pages are the same parameters we can use from our live viewing page. And we do this by tapping on the RGB traffic light system and enabling them from the panel. We can also utilize our magnification from this window and we can turn on specific guides and tools which I've already shown earlier in the video. So these same functions can be enabled directly from the monitoring menu. So in our tools area, the false color can be enabled and we can select our exposure false color designed for the log image or video false color designed for the LUT image. In the peaking window, we can select the type of peaking available and when peaking is selected, we can adjust the intensity of the peaking lines. So how obvious they appear on the LCD and the peaking color. We can also adjust our zebra levels and we can choose both a low IRE and a high IRE. This provides an area of control for what the zebra levels are looking at in terms of their light reflectance. And this can be really useful if we're specifically trying to narrow the middle gray point, skin tones, or shadows and highlights. So this can be really useful. And we have two zebra levels, which will appear as two different colors. We also have our guide area. And within here, we're able to select the aspect ratio that will be most appropriate for our needs. These overlays are a compositional tool to ensure that your frame is correctly composed for your post-production workflow. We have four by three for a traditional square format, 16 by nine for modern television aspect ratios, 1.85 designed for theatrical releases, 1.9 which is the IMAX ratio, and 2.4 to 1 for a theatrical widescreen ratio. The guide window allows you to preset three separate aspect ratios should you need to quickly adjust for workflows. Within each guide, scale allows you to adjust the size of the aspect ratio in relation to the image, and I'd recommend keeping it at 100%. We also have a center guide window, which lets us set either a small or medium dot and crosshairs. These can help with composing central objects and applying symmetry to your frames. These can be viewed in a variety of colors and their opacity can be shifted to appear solid or transparent. In our media page, we have the ability to look at our card information, providing us with the card status, the model and serial number, and showing how much capacity is available. We can also perform a secure format, which will delete and permanently erase any media from the cards. Now, if you have the Red Komodo turned on and you want to eject the CFast 2.0 card and start transferring media to a hard drive while also inserting a fresh card to continue recording, then you can safely eject the card from this window as well. When you go to the eject tab and hit OK, the card can be removed while the camera is turned on and you can then replace it with the second card. You'll notice the eject and format icon will be grayed out and this will only become available again once the card slot at the side has been opened and the card has been removed and reinserted. This area will then become available again and recording can commence. The CF card icon on the status bar will also indicate whether the card is ready and available to use. Next, we have the presets page, and within this page, we can create our own preset for the camera. From this window, we can select specific parameters that we'd like to save. Once our chosen settings are selected, we can name the preset, and once it's saved, it will become available from the in-camera preset window. Currently, we have no preset selected or saved. If we wanted to export the preset, we can also do this from the same window. If these presets had been exported to a card and you wanted to import them, you would do so from the on media presets window. 
be aware it's not recommended to save presets onto the camera's dedicated CFast cards, as they'll need to remain with the camera at all times, and therefore cannot be lent out to individual students. If you wish to create your own preset, please use your own CFast card. The Red Komodo also has autofocus. From within here, you can enable the autofocus and this will place a square box across the LCD screen. The auto box can be set as small, medium, large, wide, or vertical. And these will be shown on the live viewing page. For our position, we can either choose custom, which allows us to place the focusing box anywhere across the frame, or we can choose a predetermined area of the frame. However, even if you pick a specific position for the autofocus, it can still be manually altered and placed into a different position. So because of this, I tend to leave it as custom. You can then start the autofocus directly from this window, or when on the live viewing page, you can tap the autofocus box to initiate the action. The box will turn yellow when it's searching for a focus point and turn green when it's achieved focus. All guides such as focus, edge and peaking will still be available while using the autofocus system. Then we have communication and this is where you'll set up and connect the Komodo to your phone's Wi-Fi and then the red camera control app. When you enter the communications window you'll be able to view the camera's name which can be left as Komodo and then you'll want to enter the Wi-Fi menu. From here, you'll want to choose mode and select ad hoc. Once ad hoc is selected, open the ad hoc window and this will give you the camera's SSID, so the camera's connection name and password for connecting the camera to your phone. At this stage, you'll want to go into your phone's Wi-Fi, select the camera's SSID name, and if it asks for a password, input the passphrase sequence. Once this has been performed, you'll then open the red control app. Navigate to the first window and press the red scan icon. Doing this should provide the app with a Komodo icon signaling a secure connection. And you should now have full control of the red control app. If you want a live view from the camera, navigate to the second icon from the right and when enabled a live display should appear. Each window inside the app allows you to adjust the Komodo's controls. Some additional connectivity parameters available on the Komodo are the band and channel. With band, you can switch between 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz. If you don't require a video feed, 2.4 would be more appropriate. However, if you do require a live feed, then 5 GHz would be more suitable. Personally, I tend to leave it on 5 GHz. In addition, you can also adjust the channel if you begin to see interference or have connectivity issues. However, I've never had to adjust it as it normally works without any issues. If you don't want to use the Red Control app, then I'd recommend ensuring that ad hoc is turned off to save battery life. After communication, we can adjust the system settings parameters. From here, we can adjust the date and time, we can adjust lens metadata information, and we can look at our power consumption for our batteries. Now, because these are third party batteries, we're unable to receive a percentage gauge for each battery. So you'll need to rely and check on the battery voltage from this area. You can view both battery voltages from here. Within the indicator window, you can enable a tally light, which will provide a visual cue to your talent that recording has begun on the camera. With the status settings window, we can choose whether the shutter appears as angle or time. For regular motion, angle would read as 180 degrees, whereas time would read as 1 over 50. We can also change the aperture increments. I tend to leave these on a third of a stop. The focus distance, which I keep as imperial. And finally, the white balance list mode. I prefer setting this as Kelvin, as if you were to select preset, when you enter the live viewing page, You'll notice your Kelvin scale has now been changed to a preset scale. Each preset will have a specific Kelvin range which cannot be adjusted. And personally, I feel this limits your flexibility as a filmmaker. And if you're using a camera like the Komodo, you should be manually adjusting your Kelvin and really thinking about your lighting process. 
so I keep the white balance list mode as Kelvin. Finally, we have our system status area, and this will lay out our camera information and temperature information. The temperature information is useful for ensuring the Komodo's internal parts are maintaining a reasonable operating temperature and not overheating. If this occurs, the camera status tab will tell us. To ensure the Komodo doesn't overheat, ensure the fans are never covered and you're filming in sensible temperature conditions. The final maintenance page is where we can adjust our language and calibrate the Komodo. Calibrate should only be performed once the camera has reached its operational temperature. This will normally be after around 10 to 15 minutes of the camera being powered on. The camera's mount cap also needs to be attached when the calibrate function is performed. The calibrate function is performing a black balance, checking for hot pixels and optimizing the sensor to ensure it's working to the best of its abilities. Normally, the camera will inform you that a black balance needs to take place and it will do so from the T, E icon on the status bar. If the T and E icons are both green, it means the camera is good and happy with the temperature. If the T or E turns yellow, the camera is telling you that it may be a good idea to consider performing a black balance. If the T or E icon turns red, then it's highly recommended that you perform a black balance, otherwise your image quality may be affected. The calibration window is where you'll select the type of black shade calibration to perform. You'll have two options in here, user and factory. If a black shading has never been performed, then only the factory option will be available. And this is what you should choose. Once an initial black shading has occurred, a user option will become available. And from this point onward, it's recommended by Red that you should always choose the user option. It's suggested by RED that calibration should be performed in the following settings. When shooting in an environment in which the temperature is significantly different from the previous black shade calibration, when there's a drastic change in exposure time, or after updating the firmware. Hopefully this has been helpful. Thanks for watching. Keep shooting, keep being creative, and we'll see you soon.